Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and we are back for season two of Halting Towards Zion. We're talking about success today, and I think we will define our terms as we go. But first, let's introduce ourselves. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Greg, and tell us one of your favorite poems. You don't have to recite it on the air or anything. Just <laughs> tell us the title and author. Well, my name is Greg Uttinger. I am a high school homeroom teacher. That's one way of labeling myself in a Christian school in Sacramento, California, Sacramento-ish, California. Uh, I teach history, theology, worldview classes, and I'm supposed to be a physics major, so math and science occasionally. <laughs> uh, I've been teaching for a long time. And of poems, yeah, um, I'm glad you said one of your favorite poems. Because oh, yes. <laughs> it, var it varies. And, you know, does anyone really have a favorite poem? Should they? Are they entitled to? Uh, I'm I feel like it's go. a Herculean effort to pick one favorite poem, so it wasn't fair to ask yeah. for just one. Uh, I'm going for, I, I think mostly because I have a mental block on it and can't seem to get any further. I'm going with Tennyson's Ulysses, mm. Time to Strike Out for Another Newer World and Find Adventure There. It little profits that an idle king. Yeah, that Is one. That it especially appropriate to someone who's getting a little older. Great. Thank you. Brian? Um, I'm Brian Broom. I am a layperson with an interest in theology and member of the OPC. There we go. Um, <laughs> I'm a recent Californian expat um, <laughs> and uh, immigrant to the great Midwest. As far as poems, the only one that really comes to mind that I have read is the one that has been memed into in Anathy, and that is, <laughs> this is just to say by William Carlos Williams, a tale about regret and plums. <laughs> oh. Good choice. Good choice. And I am Emily Maxson. I have a background in education and education policy, as well as history. I enjoy running this podcast with our producer, who is my lawfully wedded husband. Grew up in California and returning there shortly to continue teaching. My poem of choice today is going to be The 13th Trump by Banjo Patterson. All right. So today we're talking about success and we're drawing on Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. Malcolm Gladwell is a Canadian sociologist, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Journalist and, in any case. And he talks about three main factors, or rather two or three main factors that lead to success. That is time and chance, uh, the fortuitous timing that comes to certain people where they get right in on something as it's growing. And so they're an early adopter. Their cultural legacy, which almost falls into that category of time and chance because you don't really have a choice into what culture you are born. And also grit or hard work. Um, so what are some examples of these three factors working together? What kind of success are we looking at here, Greg? You know, one of the things, one of the weaknesses of um, Gladwell's book, and it has many, many strengths. It's a delight to read. But he, I, he never, at least to a Christian satisfaction, really defines success. I think he assumes that we know what success is. And that I, th I think he would probably acknowledge that it's a little different for everybody. But it involves being good at something to such an extent that there seems to be financial profit in it. <laughs> I don't think he would say that it's getting rich necessarily. But in the examples he gives, uh, having money at the other end seems to be a pretty constant factor. Not Maybe not filthy rich money, but substantial increase of where you might be. Let's say that I don't think he considers poverty as winning the game. <laughs> so, but working with that, he, he's, he's looking at all kinds of things. 
In fact, one counterexample right off the bat that can disprove what I just said. He looks at a, a small immigrant Italian community mm. that yeah. was remarkable for not having it's Rosetta, uh, Pennsylvania. Ros Rosetta yeah. Pennsylvania, settled by immigrants who came from a single village in Italy. Men worked in slate quarries, uh, women in blast factories. Uh, they lived largely isolated aside from shipping in, shipping out their stuff and taking in such supplies as they needed. But eventually, uh, a doctor discovered something odd about the community, no heart disease. Furthermore, no suicide, no alcoholism, no drug addiction, and very little crime, no peptic ulcers either. Uh, most of the townspeople were incredibly healthy and died of old age. Uh, the answer was diet, because in coming to America, they gave up uh, olive oil for lard and added a whole lot more salt and sweets. They didn't exercise. They smoked heavily. There was nothing in their genetics because other immigrants from the same village went elsewhere and did not uh, evidence the same kind of vigorous health. In the end, researchers concluded that what they had was community. Peaceable, loving, predictable relationships with people they trusted, spent their lives with, and that lack of pressure from work or from society or keeping up with the Joneses allowed them to relax and to enjoy life and to be healthy. Stress was minimal and their hearts were strong. So here's a case where, where Gladwell is pointing at something other than just making money. Here he sees success, it would seem, as being content with life and the, and the lot that you have and enjoying life and being healthy long enough to actually enjoy it for a good long while. Other kinds of things, the, the book starts off, as I recall, one with that example, but then also something odd about uh, Canadian hockey players. It seemed that everybody who went pro had a birthday around January 1st, in January or, or early February. And the more uh, researchers looked into this, Gladwell looked into it, um, it was kind of a puzzle because what in the world does your birthday have to do with how well you can play hockey? <laughs> well, eventually he came to the conclusion it had to do with how the various youth hockey leagues were structured in Canada. Uh, the cutoff age for eligibility was January 1st. So that means in January, everyone who's born then gets in to the new round of league events and has all the whole year to learn at that level. Meanwhile, the kids who come in in December are already facing competition from their peers who have been in for a year. Mm -hmm. And so... So you've the, got the, the best of the nine-year-olds and the best of the... Well, it's not divided by how old you are. It's divided by the year you were born. Right. So you have the people born in January competing against those born in December. So you're already 11 months stronger, 11 months bigger, mm -hmm. 11 months more practiced. And so uh, over the course of the coming years, as these kids move up through the various leagues for older and older children, the ones who have had that little beginning, that little edge, begin to develop it into a bigger edge because the coaches are going to gravitate to the kids who are already better. Mm -hmm. So they get better still. And then the next round, oh, you're, you're, you're so much better. We'll work with you. And they get better still. And so by the time we're done and, and they're, they're hitting late high school or college or somewhere in there, they're really good, not necessarily because they have native abilities better than their peers, but because they've had so much more focus put upon them. And, and so this is kind of the time and chance thing. These are circumstances that no one controls. You can't control when you're bored. You can't control that before you were born. This is how the hockey system was organized. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have nothing to say about this. And all the native talent in the world will not necessarily fix this or counterbalance it. And so the system rolls on. Apparently, it's true also in American sports to a lesser extent. So um, is this systemic discrimination against hockey players <laughs> born in November and December? Yes, that is exactly what it is. Systemic discrimination. There ought to be a law. <laughs> no. yeah, I'm sure somebody thinks so. Someplace. Leagues should be split by birth month. <laughs> there you go. That's the rule. Oh, so now we've got to have 12 so, different leagues Yeah, we have 12 for every leagues year. now. Oh, yeah. goodness. No. This is, this is how you have to do it to, to seek justice. Right. Meanwhile, 
the small schools have no one to play against because you've got one kid in each. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody gets any better at hockey. The small schools are left. But we're all equally bad together. (laughs) And that's it, isn't it? That we all be the same. We all be equal. And, And there's a thought to throw in this. I don't remember to what degree Gladwell addresses this. But in talking about success, that implies some people get stuff that other people don't. However you define mm-hmm. success, mm-hmm. it's uh, forget the monetary rewards of, of being a star hockey player. You're just acknowledged as better by your whole country that happens to revel in hockey. Isn't that kind of anti-equalitarian or anti-egalitarian? If we, as you say, we have an entire system that's dedicated to promoting something we all love, and yet it is seriously uh, slanted in favor of some people over others, and nobody gets a say in it, particularly the people who are affected. This, isn't that something that, that people in the 21st century ought to be protesting somehow, some way? <laughs> uh, any kind of systemic discrimination obviously is evil and needs to be stopped by the blunt force of a government that loves you so much, <laughs> or so we're told. Anyway, I don't remember your original question, Emily, but it was something along the lines of what kind of stuff does he talk about? And these are some of the the intriguing scenarios that he he brings to light. Uh, I'll throw in another just for fun because it's short. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and that whole flight of very impressive computer technicians and programmers. Uh, they're all about the same age. <laughs> and they were the same age just as the whole college is getting college local colleges and sometimes high schools getting their own computer system was a thing and these were young men who managed to sneak out of the house at night <laughs> sometimes literally all night long or sneak over in the summer to the local high school local college and do nothing but program they were able to indulge their uh, hobby to their heart's content they put in lots and lots of time and they became really, really good just at a point where the computer industry was beginning to take off. They had the opportunity that other people didn't have. They had an unfair advantage as this world reckons things. And they parlayed it into millions and billions of dollars. So these are some of the kinds of things that the Gladwell is looking at. And in each story uh, is more interesting than the next. I don't remember all of them by any means, but there are a few others that we can talk about. I'm interested particularly in the ones where um, national culture, ethnic culture plays a big role, but maybe we'll we'll end up there uh, eventually. So right now we're seeing the time and chance thing, and we're also seeing the hard work thing. If you can work really hard at just the right time, a time you can't control, then you may become uh, a monumental success, which may mean very rich, but it may mean something else. And we can, we'll all stand back and, and wonder at it. And the word outlier here is talking about statistical probabilities. I mean, how many Bill Gates are there in the world? <laughs> not that, not that many. How many uh, rock and roll bands like the Beatles really were there? How many communities like, what was it, Rosetta mm-hmm. are there in the world? These are outliers statistically. They're things that, Aren't they don't fit the predictability predictability models, but they're real, and so that was what he what Gladwell was investigating, and um, we can go from there. What direction you like? Yeah, um, let's talk about success in the Bible. Okay, you mention in the article that is the basis for this discussion that success is kind of an odd word. I think it's the it's only mentioned in this introduction to Joshua. Yeah, maybe this is the time to you've already said that we're beginning our second season. Maybe we should define what constitutes a season. Mm, sure. The first <laughs> the first season was a discussion governed by the Torah, the five books of Moses. Uh, this next season, however long it may actually be, uh, it will be governed by what the Jews call the former prophets. This is Joshua, Judges, Ruth thrown in, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. We might stick in Chronicles since it parallels, but that's technically outside the list. 
they were called prophets rather we we think of them as history books but they were mm -hmm. called the former prophets because they rendered God's interpretation his inspired interpretation of covenant history not to say there's a running analysis or dialogue sometimes it's very in the background or to one side and it, it takes a while to realize what why, what is God's opinion of all this? Yeah, throughout well, Judges, we don't get, and this was very bad. <laughs> yeah, we, there, there's <laughs> this a lot was of places. the wrong thing to do. <laughs> yeah, there are places where we really would like that because sometimes there are differences of opinion mm -hmm. as to whether or not this was a good thing or a bad thing. Was it a bad thing, say, for Samson to reach into the lion's carcass and pull out the honey? A lot of that depends upon your presuppositions about Samson. Mm -hmm. We could say, well, the, the dietary laws say that you can't, and the Nazarite laws say that he shouldn't be touching a dead body. Okay, granted. But did he? <laughs> well, he touched the lion's carcass, that automatically qualifies. Well, he touched the honey. He touched the honey carcass. with a stick, I believe, uh, and took it away in his hands. So do we simply assume that, well, we see all kinds of things that he does that are really sketchy and borderline. So this is just one of them. It's one of the first and it's just setting the pattern. Or do we say, but wait, he's the Lord's Messiah and marked out by Hebrews 11 as a man of faith and given the benefit of the doubt and say, he didn't have to actually touch the dead body to do this and probably was smart enough not to. Uh, and so there are, there are lots of things in, in Judges where we have to First of all, understand the Torah that's gone before. Understand God's broad perspective and narrow perspective on morality. What are the general principles? What are specific applications? How have we seen it work out in specific life cases before? And then we're supposed to come with the Bible's perspective of this is a story about Messiah. So let's not miss the details, the, the, the force of the thing in the details by saying, but, but he broke a rule. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but we have lots of heroes in the Bible who break lots of rules. <laughs> uh, and that ne does not necessarily invalidate the bulk of the ministry. Uh, and, and so as we're, we're passing through the former prophets, we, we don't always have a, and this was bad. It's kind of refreshing sometimes when we do. You can <laughs> yeah, it takes the pressure off. Like, <laughs> it's, it's such a difficult thing to discern right from wrong in general. Like we want the CDC to come and tell us what it's okay to do and what not to do, for instance. Yeah. Uh, and so it's nice when you come to say uh, David sinned against Bathsheba and the writer says, but the thing that David did displeased the Lord. Okay, we thought so, but... <laughs> yeah. It's good to know for sure. He, he conned Bathsheba and, and no one's saying anything bad. This was wrong, right? I mean, this is the God, the man after God's own heart. It's, it's, it's wrong. Yes, it's wrong. <laughs> Just in case God tells us on that one. Mm -hmm. And so we're having to interact with the text, uh, but at the same time realizing there are some things that God tells us and this is the job of any good historian. You're not simply reciting facts, you're telling a story. Mm -hmm. stories, have, stories have a point. And so we have to look, why did God pick these details rather than other details? Why does he highlight this but ignore that? Interesting thing here is to compare Kings and Chronicles, which cover much of the same territory. And yet there are some very real differences, the sin of David being one of them. Chronicles doesn't mention it. Mm -hmm. But... Samuel makes a big deal over it. But actually, if you think about it, David's later sin in numbering the people cost a whole lot more lives directly, mm -hmm. thousands of lives, whereas his sin with Bathsheba cost one direct, well, one and a few because Uriah didn't die alone Fourfold. in battle. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, the baby and then his sons who die in judgment. But still, mm. compared to the thousands who die uh, when David numbers the people, the, uh, most newspaper reporting might make a big deal out of David's sin at the time. I mean, it's tabloid stuff, but the stuff that's going to hit the headlines of uh, the New York Times is going to be tens of thousands die because of King's mistake. <laughs> Imagine a president. You know, do we do we do the the president was unfaithful, or the president just pushed a button and killed, destroyed a city? of 50,000 people or whatever the number was. 
and so we're we're the very writing style and the selection of material leads us to ask, what is God getting at? Kings, appropriately, the emphasis tends to be upon the reign of the kings. Chronicles, there's much more material about the temple and the priesthood uh, and worship and mu music in worship. And so they're not, they're covering the same facts to a large extent, but they're not the same story. And they're not the same prophecy. They're not the same message exactly. Well, that's our goal anyway. We're going to go through um, the former prophets. Uh, so there'll be in the background of our discussion some historical context and, and, and um, stories that we simply will mm -hmm. have to talk about from time to time. Here, we're beginning of the book of Joshua, which is the first of the former prophets. And uh, Moses has died, and he's already been set aside as Moses' successor. And God tells him, Moses is dead. You're going to go over. You're going to lead the people across Jordan. In every place your sole of your foot shall tread, I've given you, as I said to Moses. No one will be able to stand before you. I'll be with you as I was with Moses. I won't. I will be with thee. I will not fail thee or nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. You're going to divide the land to this people. Only be thou strong and very courageous. But thou mayest do thou mayest observe to do according to all this law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whither thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Lots of encouragement going on here. Moses didn't get this kind of encouragement. Moses got, get over there and do this. <laughs> but I have an excuse, dumb excuse. I have another excuse, dumber excuse. I have a third excuse. Really? Get over it. But God is very tender with Joshua. Uh, I suspect because his skill set lay in a different direction than Moses. Uh, when we see Joshua, he he never seems to be afraid in battle, which leads me to suspect that it's working with people that's the thing that scares <laughs> him. And in that, I sort of relate to him on that level. It's one thing to give orders. Yeah, go take that hill. Yes, sir, sir. Uh, it's something else to sit in this committee meeting and make peace between <laughs> these people. Can I just fall on my sword and get it over with? <laughs> And so God is really encouraging him, and he points to prospering and good success. He promises to be with him and all that. The um, the word success, I'm quoting myself here, the Hebrew word can mean to have insight, to act wisely, or to prosper. Success, as God sees it, is the wise application of his law. It's obedience to God's law intelligently, with an eye, the eye of faith, looking at the goal of what God's getting at. It's not enough to be right. It's to be right for the right reason, with the right motivation, the right heart attitude. A lot of people pride themselves on how right they are, but that's not necessarily wisdom, nor does that necessarily lead to the kind of success that God's looking at. In this case, success means fulfilling the promises of God. God has promised Israel the land. It's uh, Joshua's job to deliver it to them. Yes, there is, in fact, wealth involved here, real estate. But if Joshua will keep his heart uh, set on the law of God, if he will continue to meditate upon that law day and night, then if he will hide the word in his heart, as Moses suggested in Deuteronomy 6, then, then he's going to be able to do this. He's going to succeed in his mission. He's going to accomplish the purposes of God for that generation. God will bless him and he will be a blessing to others. Now, this is not earning God's blessing or earning salvation or any such thing. God has blessed him. God's going to be with him. God's promising him all kinds of great things. So, but I need a roadmap. I need to know how to get from here to there. And God says, know my word, believe my word, trust my word, think upon my word, meditate on my word, do my word. Uh, and, and so it's at this point we begin, and again, I don't know how far you want to go at this point, 
but we begin to see a difference in how culture affects one's ethical system. Uh, it is one thing to say that in cultures where there's a lot of hard work, there's a lot of success. Not necessarily true. <laughs> Depends on what you're working on. If yeah. you're working on moving piles of dirt from here to there, you don't necessarily gain a lot of glory or, for your people. Yeah. <laughs> or if you're working on building pyramids. Mm -hmm. You know, the Egypt had enormous wealth, but the people remained relatively poor and simple in their lifestyle. The te whatever technology the pharaohs had to raise those things didn't get transferred down to the lowest level. And we we can think of other contexts where the goal of work can be diverted toward uh, monument building, toward liturgy, toward some kind of mystic uh, expression, uh, or it can all be hoarded by your capitalist warlords mm -hmm. uh, and and used for either making them rich and fat and sassy or starting wars with your neighbors. So it won't do simply to say if you work very hard, you will succeed. Uh, success needs definition here. And in terms of, of what, Josh, what God said before Joshua, the, the definitions were already in place. God had promised Abraham 430 years earlier that his seed would inherit the land of Canaan. And everything has been moving in that direction. And that's not simply a real estate promise, a territorial promise. It's a promise that leads to Messiah. Uh, because Messiah is coming into the real world in, in time, history, and geography, which means he's coming someplace. This is the place he's coming. Uh, and, and Israel needs to be there, and they need to be in control of the land, at least to the extent that they can produce the seed in, by God's miracle at the right time in the right place. So the Messiah will be there where the prophecy say he will be. So this, this is the focus of all of this. And, and yes, it's very, it's, it's a, physical material blessing for God's people at the time. Far more important is that God's maneuvering all of history to prepare the way for the coming of his son. And, and again, that's very different from just saying, work hard and you get rich. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a lot more time, but um, Gladwell makes a lot of Asian math scores where students of Asian ancestry in the United States tend to work longer at math problems before giving up. And mm -hmm. so, on average, get higher math scores. And I love your point about the society not necessarily getting the benefit from the hard work. Uh, Gladwell ties it back to the rice patties of the dedication to growing rice translates into dedication in a lot of other things, including looking at math problems and not giving up on them until you've really tried everything you can. Mm -hmm. But it's largely here in America rather than in communist China <laughs> where that translates into success. Yeah. Is that purely the influence of a Christian society? Is that Christendom at play? What's going on? Uh, well, I don't think you can say purely Christendom because there's never been a purely Christendom on the, <laughs> on the earth. But right. there are there are times and places that have certainly be, been more influenced by the gospel than others. And there was a time when the cultural West spoke of itself subconsciously as Christendom because everyone pretty well at least acknowledged the existence of the God of the Bible and acknowledged the truth of the Bible and gave some kind of lip service to Jesus Christ. And along with that, traditionally came at least some kind of marginal embracing of the Ten Commandments, of traditional marriage, of the dominion mandate, the value of work, of thrift, of savings, of future orientation, uh, depending on the brand and flavor of Christianity. It's much stronger in the Christian West and the Christian East, Russia and uh, Byzantium went after mysticism at a, a very early time. And I, we probably have talked about the whole Philoque clause thing. And we could talk about Canada Christianity and all that. But Byzantine Christianity lends itself very easily to mysticism. Uh, but then you can compare um, the Catholic West with the Protestant West. And again, there's much more interaction in Protestantism with the world, the real world that God has made, uh, both in Calvin and in Luther. But of the two, after a few generations, the Calvinists, and particularly the Puritans, 
put much, much more emphasis upon work as a priestly function. You're, uh, as Luther before had said, the, the shoemaker cobbling his shoes is serving God as truly, if not more so, than the monk in his cloister. And the Puritans really took to that, almost to the extent of working themselves to death. Mm-hmm. And you can think of the Westminster Confession, which for all of its beauty, you come to the fourth commandment, and it sure sounds like taking a nap on the Sabbath day is a sin, <laughs> because you've got to always be busy. Mm-hmm. There's not really a place for for rest or recreation. The Puritans never had a good theology of recreation. They were very, very busy. And so as Puritanism died, we get the Yankee, the sharp trader, the good businessman, the man who uh, amasses wealth because of his work. So that's some, but that, in order for that to work, you do need political freedom of some extent, however you got it. Now, in, again, in the Christian West, more particularly in the Protestant West, with its opposition to, um, to emperors and popes, we have seen the growth of Republican government, of, um, checks and balances within governmental systems, popular involvement in the process of government. And another thing is that limit the power of government and give people more of an opportunity to prosper in terms of their individual gifts. So having said all that as a background, in case anyone didn't know that already, you come to America at the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, and here we have immigrants who have learned to work really, really hard, and they stepped into an environment where still it is possible to do very well, both educationally and uh, financially by working hard. And yeah, that doesn't work in communist China, sorry. But there are, there are also some other considerations and, um, we can, we can look at things like suicide rates. We can look at the culture of shame, uh, where if you don't live up to the standard your family expects of you, uh, you're under a tremendous amount of emotional pressure subject to emotional breakdowns and such, because yes, you work hard, but what if you can't work hard enough? What if you disappoint your family? Not acceptable in these cultures oftentimes. And so this is again where we're saying, in God's world, work can be very productive and can bring about success of various sorts. But in the long run, you can never abstract work from the rest of your life, mm-hmm. from your family structure, your worship, your mental health, how you look at the world, your future orientation or lack thereof. And and so as Christians, we have to keep coming back to this and say that there is no simple formula where you can just say, work really hard for a long time and hope you just happen to fall into one of those lucky cracks of time and chance, (laughs) which God's providence has arranged, because if you don't, oh, well, you're not going to be all that successful as people reckon such things. Uh, we rather say our, our treasures are in heaven. We seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. And when everything's said and done, many of us will go to our graves and no one's going to remember us, but God will. And the final word is his. When we stand before Jesus at judgment day, the measure of our success is well done, thou good and faithful servant. Mm-hmm. Because he will see all of the fruit of what we did, which goes far beyond the merely financial and even the material. Uh, We're working in things that are heavenly and eternal. We're working in human souls and in the Word of God. So we can't reduce our measurements to those of the world, while at the same time recognizing that money does answer all things, (laughs) and that God gives us the power to get wealth, and that God uses the material wealth to establish his covenant. Because, you know, you got to pay pastors and build church buildings and (laughs) finance missionaries and all of that stuff. The labor is worthy of his hire. And the labor is worthy of his hire. So we're not disdaining that side of things. We're just saying that's not all there is to it. And when all the boxes are checked on Judgment Day, that may not in all cases be the most important. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so as the Asian student comes and perhaps gets a B in math, horror, horror, and his family doesn't know what to do with that, and yet he may succeed in some very real ways. Uh, that the rest of us would say, your family's crazy. You you are successful. You've accomplished good things. You've made a positive difference in people's lives. 
but you may never convince your family of that. There's a um, a side story in one of the novels I read last year, which I will not clarify because of spoilers. Um, <laughs> where basically one character has been attempting to do a thing. He wants to atone for something in his past, and he feels he needs to have a flawless track record of the opposite in order to be counted as worthy. Mm-hmm. Now, this isn't so much societal shame as it is personal shame, but the, 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 another character gives him a remedy by way of a parable, and he basically says, there's a dog who wants to be, um, he sees a dragon flying overhead, and he wants to be a dragon. And so he decides, okay, dragons can fly. I, I just need to fly, and then I'll be a dragon. So he he makes makeshift wings for himself in in a way that a dog can. So he's dragging you know <laughs> sticks into place in the barn's hayloft or something, and he attaches it to himself by his collar, and he jumps out and immediately lands on the ground. And the other animals from the farm come around and, and laugh at him, and go, "You're a stupid dog. You're not. You're never going to be a dragon." He's sad. So he says, "Okay, I can't do that. So dragons have scales. I'll get scales for myself." And so he makes a deal with you know a wreck coon that has thumbs you know you can grab <laughs> shiny rocks from the um from the river and he'll put them there he'll go and cover himself in mud and he'll roll in the rocks and he'll have shiny scales and he'll be a dragon he'll be just like a dragon and he shows off to all the animals and they all say you're a stupid dog you're covered in mud and rocks you're never going to be a dragon finally he decides i want to be a dragon dragons they can speak human language so i will learn human language and unfortunately he is unable to speak he's i have a dog tongue i i just mechanically i can't do this and in any case he what he did learn was was language he learned writing instead so when the farmer's daughter falls into the well and can't get out he runs back and draws girl well stuck in the dirt (laughs) and run you know they go back and forth they rescue the girl the farmer goes oh my gosh you you are the inside dog now you get the (laughs) fine cut of meat you get this you get all the glory and all the honor and as he sits in his bed in the warmth next to the fire at the farmer's feet he thinks i am still a failure because i am not a dragon oh and that's sort of what these that was a very long story metaphor to get to this point (laughs) that's sort of what these things are where it's like the the things that we ourselves or the culture that we live in that puts these expectations on ourselves, they are not necessarily in line with what is actually objectively good right. to accomplish in this life. And if you never see a dime of profit, you you never start a business and give thousands or millions of dollars to the church in your tithe or as gifts. You never personally fund a missionary to Vietnam, but you shared the gospel with someone, five people, 10 people, 20 people, you're successful by the Lord's standards. And people sometimes look at Proverbs and say, Mm -hmm. well, this is a, this is a principle of Christian life. If you do X, you will get Y. And then your happiness will be Z. Mm -hmm. But there's, a lot of times in scripture where you look at God's chosen people doing X and not getting Y. Mm-hmm. And you even you especially see it in the church age, uh, post-Pentecost, actually even a little bit before Pentecost, um, where they are doing the right thing and they get persecuted for it. Right. It's not some when when you look at Proverbs as a list of to-dos in order for mm-hmm. your own personal benefit, for one, you're missing the point. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and for two, you're turning the Christian life into a system of law yeah. rather than something that is driven by the gospel and the law in its proper place. Right. The the That's law of God is the most comprehensive, the most demanding of any law there could be. So when we turn the Christian life into this perfectionistic endeavor, like I, I struggle a lot with perfectionism. Like I will lie awake at night thinking, am I a good friend? You know? <laughs> and the answer is no, I'm not, but Jesus is. Mm-hmm. And it's for his sake that I can rejoice in God's friendship to me, that his fellowship 
when I am united to Christ personally by faith, God delights in me, not just in my sanctification, in me as a person. Mm. And that's the most freeing message because it sets us free from the most comprehensive bondage. Well, that's like when Paul says his righteousness is as filthy rags. He wasn't just talking about himself because he used to be a Pharisee. He's talking about all human endeavors <laughs> right. done with the best intentions, even those done as believers post-conversion. It is, it's not, nothing we do is untainted by sin, and only that which is untainted by sin is able to stand in the Lord's presence, which is why only Christ's works stand, which is why we need his works imputed to us and our sinful de decrepitness <laughs> imputed to him on the cross instead. Yeah. And so that gives us a very different philosophy of success. We stand before Jesus and hear, well done. It doesn't mean, boy, that was close. You know, <laughs> there were 10 boxes and you checked off five and a half of them. So I guess I'm going to commend you, but... Don't pull it that close again, bud. I don't know. We, we we have more room in heaven. Fortunately, there's just a little wiggle room for you, I guess. There, there are Christians who approach the Christian life that way. They think that that's how God is. And uh, they are afraid that I have not done enough because they do not see that their sins and their righteousnesses are covered by the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that since God sees us in him, if we are acting in faith, even though, and then this kind of comes back to where we were starting, we were talking about the histories here. We often look at the heroes here and say, how are these guys heroes? <laughs> I mean, Gideon, you're not my idea of a hero, personally. <laughs> Samson, no one's idea of a hero, apparently, except for his super strength, you know, like that, that's a big deal. Uh, David, man after God's own heart, what's this whole thing? He's a murderer, an adulterer. And he gets you know, thousands of people killed um, because of his uh, his ego. Yeah, and you can just go through the Old Testament and just check these people off and say, these are not people I want to hold up to my child as models of morality. <laughs> well, you know what? You're right. They're models <laughs> of faith. These are people who trusted Jesus. And in the midst of all of their failures, they didn't lose ever completely their eyesight their focus on Jesus, on the Messiah that was coming. They, they, they came close a couple times, <laughs> but they recovered and they repented and they threw themselves back on God. You can think of Psalm 51, David's song of repentance. Uh, they, in the long run, they did not let go. They kept clinging to the cross that lay before them, to the blood of the Lamb. And what God points to, and we just fortunately just did uh, a lesson on a um, podcast on Hebrews 11, what motivated them, what moved them, what God commends is their faith. These all received a good report by faith, not because everything they did was great, but because faith motivated their whole lives, including some really weird things on occasion, like catching foxes and tying their tails together, <laughs> or sacrificing one's only begotten son, or abandoning a throne for a wilderness or building a boat in the middle of nowhere. You know, all of these things in their time looked a little bizarre and caused their neighbors to question their sanity as well as their morality. Good people don't waste their time like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but success, what, what God point, paints for us in Hebrews 11 and on to 12, is that he approved. And again, not because they did such great things, but because they did them out of faith. He approves their faith. He approves the focus of their faith, which is Christ himself. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we come to a book like, like uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, and, and there's, there's a lot we can learn here. We can learn that if you want to be good at something, 10,000 hours of practice probably is what's going to re be required. We can learn that you can't always manipulate the circumstances to get what you want, and some people get lucky breaks does the world reckon such things? You don't. Time and chance happen with all, as Ecclesiastes said. We can learn that culture does matter. And we can learn that even partial obedience to God's commandments can result in some levels of material blessing, like our Asian friends who are really great at math, because they work really hard. But we can't extend that to say, and success then means if you work really, really hard and you catch all the lucky breaks, you will accomplish things that will do what? 
make the world remember you. He actually gives a couple of examples where people did things and came close and failed and aren't remembered. And you kind of get the idea, well, they weren't successful. Well, they weren't remembered. But is that what it's all about? Well, did they help a lot of people? Well, in what way and doing what? And is Jesus going to come in that in the end if it was done in unbelief? Uh, that Jesus, for instance, used the, uses the computer industry of the late 20th and early 21st century to bless his church. Absolutely. Uh, we can do a lot with with um, microchips that we couldn't do 100 years ago. And, and the church has great advantages because of that. Does that mean that uh, Steve Jobs and, and Bill Gates get a special bypass into heaven because of that? <laughs> or that Jesus is going to flash a thumbs up and say, well, you never believed in me, but look at all the great stuff you did for my church. Come on in. No, that's not the way it works. And successes is a different thing. So, again, I think this is particularly good as we begin the, the former prophets, that we remember that God looks at things differently. Mm -hmm. And the heart of success is Christ himself. And only insofar as we lay hold on him by faith are we going to be successful as God reckons things. Uh, God has his own plan for each of us. He has things, jobs for us to do, tasks set before us for which he's gifted and equipped us. And yeah, for every one of us, we are, we are created in the right place at the right time with the right gifts. And the world may not see that and they may call us losers. But God knows what he's doing. And so we're not to measure by wealth, but we're to trust God that when all is said and done and we stand before Jesus, if we have trusted him, we will hear well done. Uh, I, I'm suspicious of the song that says, farther along we'll know all about it, farther along we'll understand why. God hasn't really promised that, but maybe he'll tell <laughs> us some things. As to, okay, why did that happen? Why that financial disaster? Why did I lose all my money there? Why did I get sued when I wasn't at fault and, and the judge decided against me? Why did my health absolutely break catastrophically at this period? What was that all about, Lord? And maybe he'll tell us some of the answers to those things. Or maybe we'll or simply Or at least meet. the stories. Maybe not yeah. the answers, but the stories. Yeah, or maybe we'll find out what happened in the story beyond us mm -hmm. and how what happened to us did affect other people. Uh, but again, that's in his hands. Amen. Well, as we wrap up, usually we close with recommendations. Uh, if you're new to the podcast, usually that's what happens. But we've already told you three of our favorite poems. <laughs> so instead, I'm going to put a question out to you guys. I was chatting with a listener this past week, and um, the listener commented that the kind of conversations we have on the podcast are something so special. And it's only at very blessed periods in our lives that we get to sit back and chat with people about books and theology and the sort of thing that we talk about. And that really only springs from community, um, having people with whom to have these conversations. For us, we sort of were brought together around this one school. For someone who doesn't have that community already where they are, how would you go about making one or finding one? Well, Brian, you just moved into the hinterlands and you're engaged <laughs> in this very thing. So why don't you share your wisdom while I try to come up with an answer? Join a church. Ooh. That's the first thing anyone should do. I think if they're... Not in one already, uh, <laughs> but if you were already in a church, then uh, the best thing to do is just hang around after the service, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. 20 minutes, find someone to talk to them. Right now, just due to uh, morning schedules, I have not been able to do that very much at the church I just became a member at out here, which is slightly annoying, but um, <laughs> they do have other opportunities for uh community growth and conversation with other people. Um, I Actually, I should probably ask to get a copy of the church directory so I can be more proactive about that. I, I'm used to having it because I, I, uh, I've already had one from my previous church. But anyway, uh, but even, even before this church, when I was at my home church back in uh, California, that's, all I, that's pretty much all I did. I hung out sometimes as long as 30, 40 minutes after, after the service. We only have one service at that church. Um, 
So it was very easy to just mull about, mill about, and talk with people that you are in spiritual community with. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't always about the sermon. It wasn't always about theology, but often it was. Mm -hmm. But other times, there's, there's other things that come up in your life. And there's six other days where you're not engaged in the, the special time that is Sabbath worship. And so you just you just talk about the things that you are interested in and the things they're interested in if there's not line up there. Um, and you talk about God and what he's been doing in your life and, and how you have seen the spirit make improvements in your life as well. And you just make this a standard kind of topic of conversation. Another thing that that church did that I really, really loved was a program called Supper for Six, which is basically you sign up for a group that it's six people, normally three couples. I was always single when I was in those groups. Or <laughs> yeah, I was the seventh in the <laughs> supper. <of six>. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was nice sometimes because then they'd be like, all right, well, we've got two singles. We'll put them in the group. And it was just mm -hmm. like two guys and then two couples. <laughs> yeah, it's not always a matchmaking kind of venue. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, and you share meals at each other's house and you get to know them that way. I, I still have really good memories of my first Supper for Six crew. And I always felt bad because I, I always forgot one of the couple's names. But I know what they <laughs> look like and I've talked to them. So it was like, I, I know who you are. <laughs> so I don't need to know your name. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, I, yeah, I did feel bad about that. But that's that's my answer is, is uh, join a church. Um, for me, I've been really, really blessed. I, I have two church families that I, I worship with on Sundays uh, out here in Wisconsin. And uh, one is the OPC that I, I'm a member at, and the other is a um, an independent kind of, I don't know if they're officially 1689 Baptist church, but they're a Baptist church. And for both cases, it's like, I just, I just talk with them while I'm there. And it's already helped massively. Yeah, the Lord kind of prescribes this community for us. <laughs> Go, you need to get with these people. Um, Weird. I wonder why. Yeah. Wonder why he would do that. Speaking of which, um, that was a major theme in "Live Not by Lies." Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Good book. Recommended. I don't know that I have a better answer than Brian. I'm not sure there is a better answer than Brian's. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so thank you for clearing so much ground all at once. <laughs> uh, I, I I can add a couple things that might nuance it a little bit. Anybody who knows me knows I'm an introvert, and the kind of thing Brian's describing is difficult for me, almost psychologically and almost physically. But I've learned to do it to some extent over the years, and particularly when I became an elder, I was reminded repeatedly by other el older elders and my wife that this is what <laughs> elders do. But I I have found that I tend to do better talking to older people, people older than myself, and, and often older singles. Uh, and also to, I'm a, I teach teenagers, so teens and 20-somethings oftentimes. But both require humility of a sort. With older people, you have to be humble enough to shut up and listen. Not they may not know all that you know. They God may have had them on a very different track, but they have wisdom. Mm -hmm. They have experience, and what you need to do is get them talking. It doesn't need to be about what you want to talk about, what you want to hear, what tickles your fancy. Sometimes you need to learn to just be quiet, except for a few more prompting questions, and then, well, how did you do that? Well, what happened next? You know, to get get you get the older set talking because there's a lot there. And often older people will appreciate that someone's actually spending some time with them. Mm -hmm. We can very easily push them aside. Uh, and then with, with younger people, you, you need to have the humility to say, okay, you're teenage. Okay, you're 17. You're the stupidest age of your life ever. <laughs> um, but not say that. Just, you know, work with them as best you can. Talk to them. Don't, don't pretend to tell them how they ought to live their lives. They have parents mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you, sh you should be able to just talk to them without setting up this judgmental aura. Uh, he's just listening to me to see what mistakes I'm going to make, and he's going to pounce on me and give me advice. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to be 
you know, laid back and just talk and see where they're at and see what interests them. And sometimes you find some some very interesting things. Uh, was uh, a student who at the time was, I, I was in college, he was in high school, who first recommended Narnia to me. I'd never heard of it because in the circles I traveled in when I was very young, Christians didn't do fantasy. So that was right. <laughs> oh. and, and I, but I, I, I'd heard a little bit about it and I asked him if he'd ever read this Narnia thing. And he said, yeah, it's, well, it's, see, there's this talking lion, but, oh, and it's really good, but I don't know, maybe it's a little blasphemous because it's almost like the lion's <laughs> god. Yeah, wait, <laughs> I, I, I think I may know what's going on there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can get, you can get suggestions and ideas and thoughts. What, what are young people listening to? What are they watching? Listen to it and watch it and go back and talk to them some more. Why, why did you like this? Mm-hmm. And don't be snappy judgmental. It's, mm-hmm. Okay, they found something in it. You found a lot that's reprehensible in it. Okay, try try, try to understand. And again, this, this involves a certain humility. The other suggestion I, I would throw out there, and this is kind of a, a deliberate Deliberate creature, create your own culture that you actually do enjoy. <laughs> book clubs. My wife has uh, been part of creating two different book clubs. You know, one I think one was with ladies, it started with ladies in church, I forget the other one. Where, first of all, in theory, you're getting people who like to read. In theory. <laughs> Doesn't always work that way. <laughs> Some people come along for the wine. And, you know, wine, cheese, and sloppy. Um, but you know, here's a chance where you act, you read a book a month and you get to someone, someone that hopefully you trust a little is recommending it. So that, that's the way. And, you know, there are all kinds of, of clubs, meetings, organizations, communal groups that Christians can create for their own interests that don't have to be exclusive. They don't have to be snobby. Mm-hmm. They can just be open to anybody who wants to come. And, but again, you have the humility of, Oh, she's not one of us. She doesn't know these names, these books, these places. I don't know. She got mustard here. She might know Hmm. other ones that you don't. (laughs) Yeah, she might know stuff you don't know. Oh, wait, she doesn't know the books, but wow, the hors d'oeuvre she brings. Uh, (laughs) uh, In my wife's book club, for instance, once a year, they at least, they have a um, a month devoted to cookbooks. Mm. (laughs) And what, and that everybody has to bring something from the cookbook that they've all read and make it, you know? So that's branching out into other kinds of things. You start with books, but now you're going for food. And from there, it's talking about cooking and all all kinds of things. So sometimes you have to take an active role and to get where you want to be, the line may not be direct. You may have to get humble yourself and consider how can I minister to other people? What will make them happy? What in this? What's lacking in this church where I see a need? I, I talk to these older folk. What was they like? Oh, they want to learn. They want a bridge tournament. I have no idea how to play bridge. But, <laughs> very you know, people, very but, few people yeah. have any idea how to play bridge. <laughs> Not in this century what of this is country. this? It's a bridge <laughs> tournament. You have the building supplies right there, and we've got little <laughs> scale. <laughs> So anyway, those those are at least some thoughts. Emily, what thoughts do you have along these lines? Uh, I would second everything that both of you have said. Um, I think practically, um, as an intro- introverted person myself, what's been tremendously helpful is finding one friend. Mm-hmm. And it often helps if that one friend is a lot more talkative, <laughs> has a lot more energy. <laughs> And can carry you oh. through other conversations with more people. And that's how you meet other people is because this person's <laughs> meeting tons of people and I'm, well, standing next to them. So. <laughs> Observe yeah, the kind church of going like introvert as it <laughs> attaches itself parasitically to its extroverted friend. Yep. The story of my <laughs> yes, life. Yes, that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh. All right. Well, we are actually quite a bit over time. So we will wrap up there. Um, thank you guys so much for this conversation. It is a delight, as always, to see you both and talk with you both. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Uh, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Let us know your favorite tips for meeting people with whom you can have conversation. Also, let us know if you'd be interested in a Discord server. 
<laughs> something I just kind of thought of today that would be really fun. It would give us a way to connect with you and hear your thoughts and have some of these conversations on Discord. Um, you can like our Facebook page. Uh, you can check out our show notes and transcripts. Any books that we've mentioned, we link to in our show notes and we have transcripts if you prefer to read the show rather than listen. If you'd like to support us financially, you can do that at our website, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. And you can follow me on Goodreads, where I put thoughts about books that I have read, whether they are good or not. The thoughts of the books. Both. I don't know if <laughs> my thoughts are any good. Um, they are there for the taking or the leaving. Emily, have you heard of um, Storygraph or The Storygraph? It sounds familiar, but I don't know. It's a it's a Goodreads alternative that I have been experimenting with, and it seems to fix a lot of the problems people have with Goodreads as a oh. system that is built the way that Goodreads is. But anyway, that's okay. just in the Well, same. I like a lot of friction in my user interface. It keeps me from getting <laughs> addicted. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I should investigate Storygraph because I might get addicted and that would be a problem. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me more about this later. (laughs) Uh, Thank you so much for listening. Have a good night.